Hello, how are you? Yeah, I'm alright. I've been meaning to do this for a very, very long time. Um, basically, I like I like watching videos like this, where people go through what they've read. Usually it's what they've read in a month. But um, this is going to be what I read in a year. What I read in 2019, basically. Last year I had... I'm so out of breath for some reason. <laughs> basically, last year I had a bit of an educating Rita Julie Walters moment in that I started to play catch up with lots of classics that I've just haven't read. And you know, I I got to a point where I was like, okay, I'm in my I'm in my thirties now. There are some books that I really, really should have read by now. It's you know, it's just not on. And generally the only the amount of books I read is only about like five books a year maybe. Something like that. Um last year I read uh I think it was 35 in the end. So I was pretty pleased with myself with that. Now I know that for some people, uh, you know, 35 books is a weekend basically. You know, some people read, you know, over 100, 200 books, I don't know. But um, I'm sweating. Um, but for me, you know, 35 was enough. And um, I'm proud of the books that I've managed to read. Some of them were more challenging. Some of them were, most of them, I, I enjoyed most of them. I suppose as a, as a disclaimer, um, these are just my opinions. I'm not trying to proselytise my opinion onto yours. Although I don't think there's any, there's no book that I'm planning on trash talking too much. So you don't have to worry about that. I'll probably set up some timestamps so if you're interested, you can click on the relevant time. <laughs> I'm sweating. Why am I sweating? Oh dear. Anyway, let's get to it. So I didn't start out the year thinking I was going to make reading a big old hobby. Um, basically, I started out, if we go back to January 2019, I started out reading a book that I had read before. This is the only book this year that I have read before, and that is uh, 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Now, this is one of my favourite books. It is, um, and it's still one of my favourite books. If you were to mention this book to someone who wanted to show off, they might say, oh yes, magic realism. And you can say, yes, indeed, uh, it is magic realism. <laughs> and it's one of my favourite books just because it is bonkers. It is really, it spans a whole, I think it's like seven generations in total of people. It's got it's got everything in it. It's got murder, it's got love, la lust. Um, it's got... Um, uh, industry coming in and destroying everything. It's got some um, genocide. It's got everything. It's got uh, men with massive muscles and tattoos and massive willies and stuff. Um, I think the reason why I like it so much is that it, because it is, like, as I say, it, there, there are bonkers stuff that happens in it, but the tone is very um, straight faced. I guess that's the thing with magic realism is that it's, you know, the weird stuff can happen, but it's not as if it's fantasy, it's it's told as if it's kind of just everyday occurrence. So I was reading this um, on my commutes and I realised that, oh, I can read a book on my commutes. That's good. So I decided to um, read some more. Um, and next I decided to read, I, was just, I decided that I wanted to read something gay. I wanted to read something gay. Um, and the book that I chose in the end was uh, Morris by E.M. Forster. Now this is uh, an interesting book, if you don't know you probably do, but... Um, so he started to write this I believe in 1913 um, and then he kind of went back to it throughout his life but it was only published posthumously um, in the 70s and the reason why this is such a um, a important book for a lot of gay men in particular is because it's um because it was written um in 1913 it's a very kind of direct um uh reflection um, and realistic reflection of what it was like to be gay in that time and yeah and even though you know we've come a long way in you know 100 years um there's definitely I was reading it and thinking, oh god, I really relate to this. It's that kind of um, the the shame that comes along with being gay, um, and 
you know, and the self-hatred. I mean, there's a lot of kind of what would, we would now say internalized homophobia. Um, but yeah, it's a very interesting book. It's a very important book. I really liked it. Um, my alternative title to it would be Go Get Yourself a Gardener. Um, yeah, it, I would highly recommend it. Um, next, I wanted to read something lesbian, Ruby Fruit Jungle by Rita Mae Brown. This was published in the 70s, I believe. Bear with, bear with, bear with, yeah, 1973. Um, now this is, it turned out to be a really good companion piece to Morris. If you are in a reading book group, I would highly recommend that you read Morris and Ruby Fruit Jungle afterwards because they make oddly good companion pieces because they're sort of the complete opposites of each other. Whereas Morris deals with repression, this deals with, um, I guess, sexual liberation. Uh, coming of age novel, so we see her from childhood through to becoming a young woman. And yeah, kind of, it's quite episodic. So she goes from sort of relationship to relationship, sexual encounter to a sexual encounter. It's basically about her trying not to be boxed in, I guess. There's a lot of, um, I, w I read a little bit about this novel afterwards, and because it's written in the 70s, obviously it has language and um, kind of ideas that have kind of evolved over time. I mean, there's a lot of kind of academic dissertation stuff you can do about this novel. So, yeah, so for instance, there's a whole section where she kind of denounces the idea of um, butch and femme lesbians, and that's something that I know nothing about, really. So I won't really comment on that, but um, yeah, I just thought it was interesting. So it was at this point that I realised I'm really enjoying reading. You know, I'm reading a lot on my commutes and back at home. Um, oh, well, that was it. I When I had a look at um, this novel online, I noticed that it was on a 100 books to read before you die list. And I, I looked through the list and I realized that I had literally only read about four or five of these books. So there was like 95 sort of classic books that I just hadn't read. So I was like, come on then. And for some reason, um, to start off with, I decided to read a bit of Jane Austen. Now I've never read before this year, I'd never read a Jane Austen novel. I am quite well versed in, um, in certain adaptations of novels. So for instance, I didn't want to read Pride and Prejudice just yet or Sense of Sensibility just because I know those plots like inside and out from watching adaptations and all that. So I thought, well, I'll start with something I don't know. So in the end, I went with Persuasion and then after that, Emma. So in, retros in retrospect, I think I probably should have gone with Emma first rather than Persuasion, just because Persuasion, I think, has um, a different type of, not tone, maybe tone. People say it's the most sort of mature of uh, Jane Austen's novels. Um, I mean, the main character is 27, for goodness sake. It's, um, it takes its time. It's very kind of, it's a very slow burner. You kind of know, there's no kind of big twists or anything. You kind of know what the, traje the trajectory is, um, but it's just how you get there, I guess. And although there is a very exciting, oh no, she's hit her head moment. But next up, I read Emma. And now Emma is, Emma is um, very, very enjoyable. It's a lot longer. It's about five, it's a 500 er It took me a long time to read this. It took me like two months to read this for some reason. Um, she is, she's easy to read, Jane Austen, but she does, it is early 19th century, so there is a way of structuring a sentence that you need to kind of, or that I, I know, my dim brain needs to get used to. Um, now, something happened with Emma, I, um, I, because I don't really know the story, I know that, you know, she sets people up, that's about as much as I knew, but I, um, I went along with who I thought she was going to the person who I thought she was going to get with um, is what the book kind of want, wanted me to think. Yeah, I was surprised by the twist, basically. Or at least, no, I wasn't surprised by the twist. I um, I worked out the twist a couple of chapters before it happened. And I think generally that's a good thing 
that's a good place to work out what the twist is, you know, because any earlier than that, then you kind of get a bit, oh, come on. Um, but if you're going to work it out, then I think a couple of chapters before it actually happens is quite good, because then you're like, ah, yeah, I knew it! So from Austin to Dickens, uh, Great Expectations. Now, I had read Dickens before. Um, I'm just going to take a bit of tea. Much better. So I had read Dickens before, um, but not for a very, very long time. I think the last time I read Dickens was over a decade ago in drama school. We did Bleak House, although I think I only read two thirds of it. I know I've read Hard Times in secondary school. I can't remember what it's about, but um, I'd never read Great Expectations. Now, Great Expectations is generally the book that gets um, mentioned in these 100 books to read before you pop your clogs. Yeah, I was really, I was interested to know who this woman was, you know, Miss Havisham. You read a lot about her, but, you know, it's good to kind of uh, meet her properly. You know, I think with Dickens novels, there's the, they can be quite stressful. Um, that's kind of generally what I'm led to believe, um, you know, because it's about social commentary and about, you know, the injustice of how the working class was treated and stuff. But, um, but Great Expectations, it's, um, it's um, it's just a great read. It's a good story. Um, Miss Havisham is the boss. Um, <laughs> love her, love her. Again, the same with Emma. I kind of worked out the twist about a couple of chapters before it happened, um, which again is good. But it, I was surprised that I didn't work out before. I was like, oh, that's really good. Well done, Charles Dickens. So yes, I was pleasantly surprised by this book. So a big sort of theme, particularly with the more modern books that I read this year, was uh, the Booker Prize. Now, I, I'm i not a kind of avid kind of devotee of the Booker Prize. I know that some people are. I'm not someone who reads everything on the long list or anything like that. Um, but I have been following it for about three or four years. And generally what will happen is um, the long list will come out and there will be a book that is that will just pique my interest. So, for instance, um, you know, I've, the the North Water by Ian McGuire. I think that was on the long list about four years ago. Um, yeah, it will just sort of pique my interest, and I'll be like, oh yeah, quite fancy that. It does have a reputation, the um, Booker Prize, for being well. The the criticisms that people have are that it is. Um, I don't know, kind of pretentious and that it's very kind of snobby and um, and certainly they haven't really helped themselves with certain decisions in the past couple of years. I read the 20, the 2018 uh, winners, uh, so Celestial Bodies, Celestial Body Body Bodies, um, which won the International Prize and then Milkman, which won the kind of regular prize. Um, so Celestial Bodies by Jokha Alkhati. This is really, this is really fascinating. It's set in Oman. It's by an, it's by an Omani writer. It's translated by Marilyn Booth. It focuses on three sisters, kind of. It focuses on a lot of people, but it focuses on three sisters and their kind of relationship to marriage, arranged marriage, um, love. It's, um, yeah, that, that was one of the things that really, um, interested me about this novel was that it's there was a big theme of arranged marriages now I don't really know a lot about arranged marriages but it's important to differentiate the fact that it's not forced marriage it's arranged marriage so for instance there's one sister who flat out refuses to get married to this bloke and the family are like well, okay so the mother of these three sisters she for instance uh, she does end up in this arranged marriage and she very kind of slowly kind of deteriorates and becomes more and more disillusioned and she gets very very bitter and there's some very interesting um most of the book is in the third person but the chapters that are in the first person from the husband's point of view and um it's interesting that he absolutely recognizes the fact that his wife doesn't love him that she loved someone else before he, he came along. Um, so I found that really interesting. Um, also, it's um, it's set, I think it's, I mean, it spans over many, many decades, but it, um, 
it's set after slavery was abolished and I think it was abolished quite late like sort of in the 20th century so I thought that was interesting and then Milkman is the by Anna Burns this is the um the winner of the Booker Prize <laughs> so I really struggled with this um now many many people love this book uh and you know you can understand why but I really struggled with it um it's a very challenging book um so it's set in Northern Ireland uh, during the 70s. Um, it's first person from the perspective of an older woman looking back on her 18 year old self um, and she starts to get stalked um, quite, um, what's the word, um, intensely by this older gentleman who turns out to be quite high up in paramilitary circles and the community um, believes that she is actually having an affair with this guy um, and instead of kind of like defending herself um, she shuts down and so she lets the kind of the community at large kind of gossip and think she lets things sort of escalate um, with sort of rumors about about herself which is actually really really kind of understandable and believable because you know well it's like fight or flight you know are you going to fight your corner or in this environment um, at this time with the political climate being as it was um, do you just shut down so the, the 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 things that I had problems with and this is just me being dim um, is its style um, it's very very dense um, I realized reading it that I do actually like my paragraphs and in this book I mean there's like it's just huge blocks of text mostly well which is fine so here we go so something plot related or something interesting will happen and then a name will be mentioned or a place and then there will be a four or five page segue talking about that person or that place before you get back to the exciting plot bit and very often in that segue another name will be mentioned and then you'll have another sort of four or five page segue so I found that a little bit frustrating at times um, also right at the start of the novel you're given two pieces of information um, you're given two pieces of things that happen right at the end so you know basically what the end is going to be or you basically you know where you're getting to and and when you get there I, 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 I don't know I just found it a bit of an anticlimax however saying that I mean the language is really it's very very specific language and I really loved it I there's some sentences in it which is which are like Ooh. Um, it's this weird way of being very kind of colloquial ordinary demotic yeah that kind of speech but at the same time being really literate and very um yeah just you know there's lots of words i my vocabulary i i looked in the dictionary a lot reading this book so i would recommend it um people do tend to either love it or have pro problems with it i will definitely read it again um at some point but yeah it's not an easy book so next up is rebecca by daphne du maurier so i've got a bit of a funny story to say before we get into this book so I'm I'm a very I'm a part-time actor um, I say part-time because I generally never really act I was in town I think it was actually at another audition thing um, and I got a call from my agent and said um, okay you've got a audition for new film with Rebecca big casting director um, it's only for like a little two line you know tiny 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 part but you know you get to be seen by this big casting director and it's a you know, going to be a big film I was like great so I did what any kind of diligent actor does and I am um, I sort of I went to the nearest bookshop got a copy of Rebecca uh, went to the nearest cafe I got the sides by then and I um, scrawled the book you know trying to find where villager 2 or whatever the character was kind of comes into it quickly realized I was being way too extra it calmed down Meryl Street um, and you know just put the book aside and just did the audition and you know whatever 
didn't get the part. My Cornish accent obviously isn't on par. But a couple of months later, I realised that I had this book, Rebecca. So I thought, well, I'll just give it a read. Now, this book is always, always, always similar to um, Great Expectations. It's always on these 100 books to read before you move on to Paris. Um, I had read Jamaica Inn before, and I love Jamaica Inn. It's like a jolly good romp. Now, I love this book so much. I love this book. Um, I talked about plot twists with Emma and Great Expectations. For some reason, I just didn't, I didn't see it coming. I've, I should know enough about reversals now to spot a reversal, but I just didn't. So it's an unnamed protagonist. She is at the start of the novel. She's some kind of like PA companion to this very obnoxious uh, woman. But um, she then, the protagonist, she falls in love with Mr. De Winter, who is a very handsome, very rich bloke. Um, they have this sort of whirlwind romance. Um, they get married and then he takes her back to Mandalay, which is his big off um, manor house in Cornwall. And uh, there resides the housekeeper, Mrs. Danvers. She is, f I love Mrs. Danvers. If I, you know, if I could have auditioned to be Mrs. Danvers, I wouldn't have got it because Kristen Scott Thomas is playing that part and that's perfect casting. But I, you know, I would have given it a good go. So yeah, so the protagonist, she's constantly in the shadow of um, the former Mrs. De Winter. M Mr. De Winter is a widow and the his former wife was Rebecca. Uh, and she, by all accounts, was this really popular, beautiful, she always gave out parties and um, was, you know, loved by everyone and all. And Mrs. Danvers loved her the most and she really loved her the most. And she spends most of the novel trying to undermine the protagonist at every single turn. And then the, the plot twist happens and I was just like, and that happens, it happens about two thirds of the way into the novel. And then the novel kind of changes genres a little bit and the stakes just go vroom, right through the roof. It's like, so I just, I, I really love this novel. I can't wait to see the film. I can't wait to see, <laughs> I can't wait to see who's got my um, Village 2 part. Um, really interesting casting. Lily James is the protagonist. Army Hammer is Mrs. De Winter, and Kristen Scott Thomas. That is genius casting for Mrs. Danvers. But yeah, it was definitely one of my favourite books of the year. I recommend it. So next up, um, I decided to read a Bronte. I'd never read similar to Austin. I'd never read a Bronte before. Now with the Bronte sisters, there's the two big ones. There's Wuthering Heights and Jane Eyre. Um, and I knew that I was going to read one of those. Um, and in the end, I chose Wuthering, Wuthering, Wuthering Heights. Heathcliff, it's me, it's Cathy. Except, no, it's not Heathcliff, it's me, it's Cathy. It's Heathcliff, it's me, it's Mr. Lockwood. So this is a, this is bonkers. This is a really um, intense... I mean, people talk about this novel being, like, passionate and fiery and intense, and it really is. I mean, people... I think one friend told me to gird my loins, you know, before I read it. Um... And yes, do gird your loins before you read it. So, um, yes, it is Heathcliff, it's me, it's Mr Lockwood. Who is Mr Lockwood, you ask? Well, that is the protagonist, sort of, of this book. It's got a really strange structure, this book. Um, so it's first-person narrative from Mr Lockwood. <laughs> I'm saying Mr Lockwood a lot. Um, and Mr Lockwood is a tenant, a new tenant of Heathcliff. And he decides at the beginning... Uh, Mr. Lockwood, he decides to kind of go and uh, pay a social call to Heathcliff because he hasn't met him before. So he arrives unannounced at his house, Wuthering Heights, and he um, stumbles upon this very morose band of people, all very sullen and kind of nast bit nasty. In particular, there's a young woman called Cathy. Heathcliff is me, it's Cathy, um, who is who he's got kind of the hots for, but she's very, very sullen and and a bit angry. So um, some very strange, intense, nasty stuff happens at the house. And Mr Lockwood goes back to where he's staying and he asks his housekeeper, I think she's called Nellie, what is the deal with them lot? They're crazy. And Nellie goes, girl, sit down, I've got to tell you. And so the bulk of the novel is Nellie 
them telling first person the story of how she was basically housekeeper um, back at the Dizay and brought up Heathcliff and his history and the yeah so it's just it gets really bizarre it gets a bit inception-y because it's first person Mr Lockwood he's then telling Nellie's first person account of Heathcliff's uh, rise and fall <laughs> But then Nellie can't be everywhere either at once. She's not an omnipresent narrator. So people have to, if she hasn't been somewhere, then people have to tell her, you know, first person what's been happening. And so this, it gets about three or four people deep. So that's, that's why I'm saying it's a bit inception-y. But it's still first person, Mr Lockwood. It's really bizarre. Um, but it is intense. It is very bleak. It is um, very, very dramatic. Uh, there's a word paroxysm I learned I mean that's the kind of watch word for this book there's lots of kind of like intense like I love you but I hate you moments I mean he digs up her bones for goodness sake I mean just calm down the last kind of quarter of the book is where things really get bad and I was just like I'll give her a break will you for goodness sake um, I've heard some people say that the end is really bleak I mean I'm not going to spoil anything but I think I don't think the end is, is so bleak. I think she can handle it. I think we're given um, to assume that she can handle herself in that situation. But yeah, it's it's a big old ride. Um, yeah, I liked it. Yeah, but it's nothing like I thought. I think I was expecting, having just read a Daphne to Moray novel, I think I was expecting Jamaica Inn set in Yorkshire and for, you know, a Kate Bush protagonists with type 2 brunette hair kind of blowing in the wind and it's not that at all um it is what it is it is what it is so that's what nice. so next up um i went across the channel and started to read madame bovary now this was a bit of a um spur of the moment i'm gonna read madame bovary moment or as i like to call it drive roll up the partition please um i won't talk too much about this novel I'm into oh, my leg again. I'm interested to know whether people think that she is a heroic um, protagonist or not. I, she's just, I don't know. I think hedonism is the watchword with this one. Um, also, I love this cover. I knew before going into it that it was going to be a um, that it was a tra it was a tragedy, and that you know things don't work out so well but I was just like the end is so kind of unrelentingly kind of like everything's everything's destroyed because of what this woman died and I was just like oh, come on but what is this the colour purple yes it is uh, this is by Alice Walker of course um so again similar to Wuthering Heights sort of um it was nothing like what I thought it was going to be first of all this is um it's an epistolatory novel. Epistolatory. It's a it's a novel made up of letters. <laughs> I'd never seen the film. I haven't seen the musical. I have friends who adore the musical, um, so I was very interested to and I wanted to read um, like a twentieth century kind of classic. Um, so this sort of fitted the bill. Um, and it's nothing like what I thought it was going to be. So first of all, I mean, it is really tough. I mean, particularly the first few pages, right on the first few pages, you learn that the protagonist has, you know, she's had children by her father. Um, you know, she's really kind of horribly abused and it's just nasty. Um, so that sort of happens in the first sort of few pages. And um, it's a book made of letters, but in the first kind of third, maybe, um, these letters are more prayers and that's a really interesting device narratively for me i, I thought just because prayers are they're different from diary entries um or even letters prayers there's something there's like a need isn't there with prayers and so and she's definitely in need in the first um in the first part of the book what is so um beautiful about this novel is the fact that um the characters go through 
you know, tremendous ordeals and have everything taken away from them. Um, of course, it sets, I think, kind of intermittently between the two world wars uh, in the Deep South. Um, and, you know, with all that kind of comes with. And yeah, and despite all that, I think the book has such a powerful message of hope. I think the main the main message is that to keep hope and keep faith and stuff. Um, and the end, I mean, I really got misty eyed at the end. It's really, really beautiful and powerful and I adored it. I'm very interested to see if the film, um, I'm told that the film is quite close to, to the book and I'm interested to see how close it is. The main character is, um, well, she's a lesbian. Um, and uh, yes, I was very, very moved by this book. It's really, really good. It's one of my favourites of the year. Next up, something completely different. Cold Comfort File. <laughs> I love this. Let, let, get in, let's just get into this cover, shall we? I mean, this is it. Now, I hadn't read this before, but I am very, very well versed in the film. I love the film so much. It's, I mean, this is what the cover is. Um, this is a second-hand copy that my sister uh, gave me one Christmas ages ago, and I just haven't, I've never read it, but it, again, the film is one of my favourite, well, yeah, yeah, it's one of my favourite films. It's hilarious, and the book is hilarious. I mean, it's... I saw something nasty in the woodshed. I, I yeah. I think this is like the only, apart from Emma, maybe, um, this is the only kind of out and out comedy book that I read this year, which is a shame, really, because, you know. Um, but yeah, it's endlessly quotable. It is really funny. It's, um, and I think it's a very good example of an adaptation that is a really, really good adaptation because um, there are the bits of the novel which it changes in my opinion, um, make it better, you know, because there's certain people that, you know, people end up with, um, it's a bit sort of strange in this novel, but they kind of fix that in in post in the in the film. Um, so yeah I, yeah, I love this book. I'm going to re -re read and reread this endlessly, I think. So from sort of frothy English manners comedy to this, <laughs> things fall apart. Um, by Chinua Achibe, this is Struth. I mean, so this is kind of like a, a big sort of pillar of African literature, uh, Western African literature. The first half of the book is basically um, him and his clan and his village and the surrounding villages and kind of like the trials and tribulations of, of life there. Um, and then the second half of the novel, the white people come, the missionaries come. And um, yes, things fall apart. Now there's a point in the book which is fairly near the beginning, um, which is one of the most kind of brutal, horrible things that I've read this year, basically. Um, and when I realised what was happening, my heart kind of just like dropped. I was like, "Oh, this is going to be horrible," and it and it is. Um, Basically, I don't, I don't think I'm too screamish about stuff, but when it comes to kids being murdered, um, yeah, I was just like, oof, oh, this is really, this is tough. Um, and if the rest of the novel is like this, then I'm kind of like, oh, um, thankfully that, I mean, that's the, that's the worst thing that happens. Um, there's no children, more children being cut up with machetes, but, um, but, oh my God. What I will say, the end the ending of this book. Um, the last paragraph just puts the whole book into a different perspective. And I think I I really valued that last paragraph. I was just like, ooh, that's good. That's really interesting. So yeah, I would definitely recommend it. This is apparently, I think it's um, the first part of a trilogy as well. So I might have a go at the other two books, see what happens. Again, from from Western Africa to New York, uh, the catcher in, the ratcher in the rye, as the cave from Aladdin would say. Again, this is another book that's always on the 100 books to read lists. 
and I wasn't really interested in reading this book until my mother, my mother, <laughs> um, I was, oh sorry, I was at home and I noticed there was a copy of this book and um, my, well my, my grandmother, we didn't call her that but for the purposes of this, my grandmother um, had written in it and my mum said that it was one of her favourite books, if not her favourite book. And I was like, really? Catching the Rye, her favourite book? So I got myself a copy and I read this in a day. I read it in a day. Um, it's not the longest of novels. It's only sort of just over 200 pages. But um, yeah, I was really gripped by it. I um, There's something really, and I don't want to say profound, but, but there is something quite profound with the novel. Yeah, I just, I think by the end, there's something about the way the book talks about loneliness and um, wanting to connect and just the voice. It's very, um, I guess, I guess uh, it must have been very, very influential because um, it just captures that cynicism that young people particularly teenagers who are, you know, just sort of entering the world as adults. It captures that cynicism and that kind of deadpan kind of thing very, very well. And I, yeah, I was, I was surprisingly moved by the end. I didn't get misty eyed or anything, but I was surprised. I, it surprised me, this novel. Um, J.D. Salinger presents Hollywood stars and celebrities. What do they know? Do they know things? Let's find out. Now, you can't do a year of reading classic books without delving into a Russian. Um, well, you can, but I mean, I, I wanted to attempt some Russian literature. Um, and the one that looked the least intimidating was <laughs> um, Anna Karenina and by Leo Tolstoy. Now, this is a bit of a mammoth. It's an 800, is it? It might even be, yeah, 800 pages long. Um, and it took me, I mean, I, I did commit to this, so it didn't take me as long as I thought it was going to take. It took me about, I think it took me like three weeks, maybe, um, to get through it. So basically it follows two um, separate characters, You've got Anna Karenina and then uh, Levin, Constantin Levin, I think. Um, Anna Karenina is where all the kind of sort of big sort of plot stuff happens. She's She has this affair and... Um, similar to Madame Bovary, like she has this affair with this kind of young, swarthy guy and her life starts to sort of slowly crumble around her. The only difference between her and Madame Bovary is that she, Anna Karenina, at the start of the novel, she is at a place in society where Madame Bovary kind of only dreams of being, you know. So she's um, seemingly kind of got everything. She's got kids, she's got this husband who's a bit of a bore, but he's fine. Um, but then she falls in love with this, with this uh, I think it's called Vashinin, and things fall apart. The centre cannot hold. Then you've got this other plot, which is Constantin Levin, and he is... So I think it is, it's Leo Tolstoy kind of embodying basically um, lots of feelings and thoughts that he has about life and the world. It's much more sort of philo philosophical kind of stuff going on. Um, there's some very, very esoteric political stuff, which I found hard to follow. Um, basically about rural life being better than, I don't know. The last sort of paragraph or page, um, it has a very good meaning of life um, kind of thing that happens at the end of it, um, which I was very impressed by. I think at some point, I am um, going to attempt War and Peace, um, if not this year, then definitely the year after, because I want to try um, Brothers Karamazov before that. So after reading a book that was over 800 pages long, I decided on a novella, and I decided on Dun Dun Dun, Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. Obviously a very controversial book. I've had this copy for years and years, like over a decade, I think. I think I might have had it since drama school because it was, for some strange reason, it was on our reading list. So obviously a very controversial book. Um, I mean, I'm not going to go on too much about it because, you know, who needs 
another white man on YouTube talking about this book. Um, I think the main debate about it, I mean, I'm not an academic or anything, but the main debate about it is whether it is about racism and um, uh, imperialism and all that, or whether the author himself imbues, you know, his own racism into the story itself and into the writing itself. Um, I can, I can very much get the second argument because there's some really kind of grim, gross um, metaphors about the native African people that you know, I could just do without. Um, it is, I can definitely see why it's such an influential book. I mean, this is another one of those books on the 100 lists. Um, it's really evocative, very provocative. Um, I mean, I haven't watched Apocalypse Now, but I mean, it's got a great ending. It's got one of those fabulous kind of um, ethical, what would you do kind of question endings, which is, I was just like, ooh, that's good. Um, so I imagine that Apocalypse Now kind of follows suit with that ending. But um, in terms of the rest of it, yeah, I mean, it's kind of, I'm glad I read Things Fall Apart first, because as I say, that last paragraph of that book puts a lot of into perspective with this. So I'm glad to have read it because once you know, you know, and once you know, you know, you know. But um, yeah, proceed with caution, I'd say. So after that, I had a bit of a weird second person narrative um, kind of segue. My sister lent me this book, A on a Winter's Night, A Traveller by Italo Calvino, which is so bizarre. This book is really weird. Um, it's difficult to kind of, I can't, I don't know if I can be asked to explain the plot of all this because it's, it's really strange, but basically it's second person narrative. So, um, it's all you do this and you do that. So you at the start of the novel are reading If on a Winter's Night a Traveller and, uh, you get to a point where there's a misprint in the book. There isn't a misprint in the book, but it tells you that there's a misprint in the book. So you go to back to the bookshop and to get another copy. But when you start reading that other copy, then it's not the same book. Um, you're reading another book. And uh, every time the book that you are reading gets to a interesting sort of climactic bit, there's something that interrupts you and you have to go on this wild goose chase to find what's going on. I think that's, that's about as best as I can describe it. Um, so yeah, I'd never read a second person uh, narrative novel before and I found it really interesting. This book I would recommend particularly to writers because there's some very um, adroit kind of ruminations on what it is about about writing in general and reading and and yeah it's it is bonkers I, I couldn't follow what was happening in the the you plot um, but yeah I would definitely recommend it to writers because it is um, it is an interesting one. Um, but after that, I did get a bit kind of like, ooh, second person narrative. So I decided to try out a couple of um, pure form second person novels. Uh, the first one being Bright Lights, boom, boom, boom. No, not Tina Turner, um, Bright Lights, Big City by Jay McKinney. Um, and this is kind of, um, this is kind of as second person as you can get. Um, it is quite male gazy, and it's to do with the drug scene and the club scene in New York, and um, the wife is the bitch, and you know, and things kind of spiral downwards. But as a as a book, just to sort of experiment and see what it was like, what second person narrative was like, I did enjoy it, and I was like, oh, so it can work. So I was interested in that. I was recommended again. My sister lent me this book. Um, the Reluctant Fundamentalist, I was recommended this as another second person narrative book, although I I personally wouldn't call this second person, I'd call this, I mean, it's first person, just because the, narr the narrator isn't, although there is a you in the book, um, the you isn't the, isn't the narrator, it's basically a stylized monologue. Um, yeah, uh, people recommend you read this in a day, in a single sitting, um, I've read it over two days, and yeah, I, it is, it's, it's really, really good. Um, very, very audacious. Um, it's kind of like a, a book about 9-11 from a perspective 
kind of like an, an interesting perspective, let's say. Um, also, I didn't realize, I mean, I was about, I think, 13 when 9-11 happened. Um, and I didn't, you know, I just didn't know the political landscape globally then, of course. So I didn't know that India and Pakistan was having, you know, tensions. Um, and that, you know, the US was not helping Pakistan and all that sort of stuff. So I found that really interesting. Um, a lot of, a lot is said about the ending of the book. Don't read the, the blurb because it kind of gives it away. But a lot is um, said about the ending of this book and it is a great ending. So yes, reluctant fundamentalist. It's not a second person narrative, but it is a jolly good read. Okay, we're back in the room. So next up, we're back to the 19th century and we're back to another project book and it is... <laughs> Moby Dick. Um, oh my word. The book starts out, um, the first sort of hundred pages or so are basically uh, like a regular novel. Um, and people, when I mentioned that I was reading this book to people, they were like, oh, good luck, it's a bit of a slog. And the first hundred pages, I was like really enjoying it. I was like, this isn't a slog at all, this is great. Um, it's got a fantastic um, first-person narrator, Ishmael. Call me Ishmael, darling. Everybody does. Um, there's a all the descriptions and the places and stuff were great and you know sort of vibrant and stuff. There's a really interesting kind of bromance thing that goes on. Stick a pin in that. Um, and yeah, I thought it was great sort of set up to big sort of adventure. Um, then you get out to sea on the Pequod, the ship. Um, you meet uh, Captain Ahab, and then quickly after that, things then, it becomes a completely different reading experience. The chapters are really short, like most of the chapters are like two or three pages, so there's a lot of chapters. A lot of the chapters, once you get out to sea, are seemingly encyclopedic. They're very... Um, factual based. So there's a chapter, for instance, on different types of whales and their oil uses. There's a chapter on whale um, tails. There's a chapter on whale heads. There's a chapter on um, the colour white. There's a there's all these different chapters, basically any chapter that, which starts. I feel I have to explain. You're like, oh god, no. Not, not another one! Now my mistake was to um, read these um, kind of at surface level and not think that there was anything else to them. There is something else to them. Um, it wouldn't be, you know, a great kind of column of a great American literature if it was just about, you know, different types of whale fins, you know. Yeah, it's just important to sort of read between the lines, I think, with these those chapters. Also, um, the tone... Um, changes dramatically and the style changes all over the place. So even though it's first person, Ishmael as a character kind of gets lost. Um, there's chapters which are kind of third person between Captain Ahab and you know other characters in his cabin where Ishmael is, isn't there. There's chapters which are written out like a play script. Um, yeah, it's just very, very bizarre. The bits of plot are very exciting. There's a moment where one of the characters um, uh, gets, um, he jumps out of the boat in, out of one of the fishing boats in fear and they leave him behind for like a few hours and he basically goes mad. Um, so all that stuff is great and exciting. Um, Moby Dick itself, the whale, appears kind of right at the end and I was really kind of surprised at how unemotional um, the ending is. Um, Particularly as I was sort of kind of lamenting Queequeg, Queequeg and Ishmael's sort of bromance, there is a lot you can say. I mean, there's a big old queer reading you can do about this book. I mean, it's, yeah. I, I won't go into it but too much, but I was very surprised, pleasantly surprised, by the bromance between Ishmael and Queequeg. Um, yeah, it was, I was like, ooh! So next up, um, it was Halloween, and I realised that I hadn't read a female author for a hot minute, so I decided to read Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. 
Now this is a this is a good example of similar to Captain Ahab in Moby Dick. Um, there are certain characters in the great canon of literature, who, which even if you haven't read the book, you kind of know. You kind of have a vague um, assumption of what the character is, and that's the same with Frankenstein's monster. It's the same with Captain Ahab. Same with Miss Havisham. Um, this is a great book. It's, it's really really good. I mean, it's, there's no it's no wonder it's a classic, and there has been you know, pastiched and copied and, you know, it, there's no wonder that it's all of those things. Um, I thought I was, I thought that Frankenstein's monster was going to be a lot more benevolent and misunderstood. And yes, he is at the start, but then he gets into killing kids and killing people. And so that's not so, that's not so, um, that's not so likeable. <laughs> so yeah, I, I really loved it. So it was November and I thought, well, I'll finish off the year with three big books and then that'll be it. Not knowing that I would get through these books like no tomorrow. Um, so the first of these books was The Overstory by Richard Powers. Ooh, this is a good one. It piqued my interest um, early on in the year when I read what it was about. I mean, you could just say it's a novel all about trees and I'm in. I'm like, yeah, that's sign me up. It's very, very stressful. I mean, anything where, you know, great acres and acres of thousand year old trees are kind of cut down, you know, it's it's very, very stressful and upsetting. But it's um it's really it's very, very different. It's really it's quite brutal. I mean, the opening there's basically nine characters. So it's quite sort of Magnolia Love Actually-esque, where everything all, the, you know, I think five of the characters end up kind of meeting and sort of doing stuff together. But yeah, the the sort of first third of the book is basically um, introducing these characters to you. Um, and they each have quite sort of like quite a brutal, traumatic event that happens in their lives. And it's, when you're reading, it's like, whoa. The book kind of, it's a bit woo-woo. There's, there's a little bit of woo-woo in there, which I'm, you know, I'm here for. Um, it's not an obnoxious amount, it's just a little bit. But I was like, ooh, a little bit of woo-woo. Even though I love this book a lot, it's definitely one of my top five. Um, I thought, because I was loving it, like, in the, the depths of it, so I thought that the ending would blow me away. The ending didn't blow me away. Um, I had a bit of an issue with, issue with, um, how one of the characters' stories ended. I was like, mm, she doesn't deserve that. But um, but yeah, it is a fantastic book. Um, it won the Pulitzer for flip's sake. Um, it, it was shortlisted for the Bambooker Prize. Milkman won over it, which I can I can see why Milkman won over this one, even though I enjoyed, but I personally enjoyed this one more. Um, I think this is kind of like a classic even though it does interesting stuff structurally and is interesting, um, it's kind of like the classic great American novel, whereas Milkman, I think, is like completely stylistically and stuff. It's, it's sort of something very, very new and very, very specific. So, And it spoke to the zeitgeist of what was happening in 2018 a bit more about than this book. Um, but having said that, I mean, this is just, this is awesome. I loved it. Um, so next up is Literary Heavyweight, Iris Murdoch, and The Sea, The Sea. Um, talk about stressful novels. This is like, oh, just leave her alone, will you? Just take a hint, please. Um, so it looks, it looks really thick, but it's, um, it's just, it's a 500er, but it looks, I mean, it's like, if I get Anna Karenina, the pages must be really, well, yeah, the pages must be really thick because this looks bigger than what it is. But yeah, it's about a theatre director, a retired famous theatre director who uh, retires to a kind of dilapidated house on the east coast of England. And um, various people from his past, um, namely some women lovers from his past, um, kind of turn up in his life again. Um, specifically, um, what he believes is the love of his life, the kind of um, the one that got away. She is married now and he, the bulk of the novel is him trying to um, find ways 
for her to leave the marriage and to be with him. But he just can't take a hint. And, oh gosh, it's stressful. Um, and the ending, the, sort of the last of the denouement is um, very philosophical. It's kind of like a, almost a different tone to the rest of the book. But, um, but yeah, I'm interested to read uh, more Iris Murdoch, even though my friend said that she does tend to, you know, string you out. Um, I did feel very much strung out with this book. So this is what I thought was going to be the last book that I read in the year, but um, it wasn't. <laughs> uh, so my sister lent me this book. It's Cathcot on the Shore by Murakami. When I felt that this was going to be the last book that I was going to read, I thought it would be quite um, quite classy to bookend the year with a bit of magic realism. So I uh, went with this one. Um, I didn't enjoy it as much as I thought I was going to. Um, yeah, I, it's... Again, it's it's bonkers. I think all the stuff with the talking cats was fabulous. I loved all that. Um, there's some very um, strange, well, not strange, but there's some quite intense kind of taboo incest stuff, which for me was a bit. Um, I was I was like, oof, that's that's too much, girl. That's too much. I don't know why I I didn't like it as much as I thought I was going to. I think just. If it was all about the talking cats, I would have loved it, but it kind of, that talking cats are it's sort of like the first third, and then you kind of get onto other bits. Maybe I need to reread it again, but I'm interested in definitely re in reading um, his other stuff um, because people do love him. So I found out that I had about three weeks left of the year to go, so um, I started reading more. So my sister, I mean, bless my sister, she's given me a lot of books this year, but she lent me this book, uh, Exit West by... Uh, Mohsin Hamid, uh, the writer of The Reluctant Fundamentalist. Um, so this is a weird one. This is a very high concept novel um, set uh, against a backdrop of a migrant crisis scenario. Um, not the migrant crisis of 2015-16, but a migrant crisis scenario. So there's a couple, a new, um, a new couple, who live in a city which we are led to believe is somewhere in the Middle East, um, but the city or the country is in the throes of civil war, and the city um, sort of gradually descends into more and more chaos, um, and they have to leave. That first third is really, really amazing, um, and I kind of wish um, I, I can see why I can see why he's sort of gone down this magic realism route. But if he had gone down a completely realistic these this this couple have to leave the city and go across you know land and sea on a treacherous journey i think i think he could have done it because the first third of this book is really quite something but um this is a magic realism novel um and there are these magic doors which um you go through and then you end up uh, immediately on somewhere on the other side of the world so um instead of uh, you know, thousands and thousands of migrants uh, travelling over land and sea, suddenly um, cities in the Western world are faced with immediate thousands of migrants. The novels sort of then kind of, I think the concept kind of goes a bit too, it kind of runs away with itself a little bit. Um, it's funny about talking about believability in a magic realism novel, but um, there's a point where there's kind of like going to be a potential massacre, but um, this is in London, but the the army decides not to do it because of how they think their children's children will, will you know, they decide not to do it. And I, my cynical mind, just the state of things in the world, I'm like, my cynicism was a bit too strong. Also, it gets into kind of like utopian territory at the end, and I'm like, I don't, I'm not sure. So it's an interesting novel. Um, again, it's a very short one, um, but I think it's a little bit flawed. So there. So another book I read was a man called a man called Burp. No, a man called Ove. Yeah, this is this is fine. It's it's a. <laughs> It's a good. It's a good novel. Um, it's a, like a good, easy read, even though it's got quite sort of tough, dark subject matter. Um, it is a. It's an enjoyable read. I kind of lost patience with 
the main character towards the end, I was like, okay, I get it. And um, there's like a kind of quite angelic um, wife who's uh, dying of cancer and she's kind of like, you know, angelic. And I'm like, well, what about her anger and her, you know, fears and stuff? But, you know, but, you know, it is an enjoyable read. I would recommend it if you want something easy. Um, but, um, yeah, it's kind of, it, it wasn't my favourite of the year. So, uh, around Christmas, um, I read another Austin. Uh, I read Northanger Abbey. It's really interesting to read the difference um, and just how much better persuasion is of Northanger Abbey. Northanger Abbey, it's... Um, it's basically, from what I understand, a parody, well, a little bit of it is a parody of uh, gothic um, gothic novels. It's an interesting one. I think it's not, it's not, it wouldn't be my personal favourite Jane Austen, but I think it's, for completionists, it's a good one. Um, the chemistry between the two leads is not kind of Darcy, Elizabeth. It's not on that level. Um, but it is enjoyable. It's a very funny, there's some very funny characters in it. Um, that quiz of a hat, all that sort of stuff. I've got Mansfield Park next, and then I'm going to move on with the big um, thingies and thingies. Then the last book I read, I don't actually have with me because I've um, lent it to a friend. Um, it's The Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller. And this turned out to be, by accident, my favourite book of the year. I love this book so much. Um, if you were like me and you had a bit of a Greek mythology phase as a child, I had a big Greek mythology phase as a child, um, then I think it's very possible that you'll love this book. I, um, I think if I had read a book, I mean this wasn't published when I was a teenager, but if I had read this as a teenager it would have blown my mind. So it's basically the story of Achilles and Patroclus um, and you know the Trojan War and all that but um, it's not rather than set it in ancient Greece our universe ancient Greece it is set within Greek mythology universe so the gods and goddesses are real centaurs are real so it's it's a love story basically and it's um, and it's just so well written it's really well told um, I mean, Achilles is a dick, but um, I feel like there's enough, I don't know, there's just, for me, there was enough um, kind of heart in it for him, for it to be okay, you know. It took me back to my Greek mythology phase when I was a child, um, and, you know, I, I just, I loved every single bit of it. I wish they may, I think they're making, I really want to read, um, is it Circe? Um, so that's her new, her newest novel. I really want to read that. And then apparently they're making that into a film or a series. I mean, I wish they had the guts to make Song of, Song of Achilles into a movie or something, but that's Hollywood for you. So yes, so well done. I mean, if you've watched all this, then flip a neck. Well done you. So what were my favourite books? I hear you cry. Well, first, I mean, my, my top five. So number one is Song of Achilles. Um, second would be Rebecca. I mean, that plot twist. Uh, third would be uh, The Colour Purple. What is this, Colour Purple? Yes. Uh, fourth, The Overstory. And fifth, Cold Comfort Farm. <laughs> Watch the film. Watch the film and read the book. Nasty in the wood. Um, I don't think I'll do a worse stuff because, you know, I can't be bothered. So what's next? I mean, I, I do plan on um, carrying on, carrying on with my classics catch up. I've got a whole list. I've made a whole list of books that I want to read. Um, at the moment, I'm struggling with um, Duck's Newburyport. But, um, but yes, as I say, I, I want to finish up my Jane Austen. My Jane Austen. I'd like to read another Dickens. I'd like to read... Uh, brothers Karamamamamov as my Russian of the year. Um, I definitely need to read Jane Eyre. Um, what else? I don't know. There's a whole ton. There's a whole ton of books. Um, as well as like modern 
kind of like the modern bestsellers. There's lots of ones that I need to catch up on, like Normal People. Um, I don't know, I can't think of off the top of my head. So yes, well done if you've um, watched this far. Thank you very much if you've watched this far. Thank you if you've just skipped through. I know that's what I do with videos like this, I just sort of skip through. Um, but yes, so have a good time, <laughs> have a good year, have a good day, and bye bye <laughs>